Welcome to Living and Marcelo's Criminology Podcast, a podcast hosted by Marcelo Aevi from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland, and Living Powers from Ghent University, Belgium. We aim to draw a map of the state of criminology across Europe through the words of contemporary criminologists. How is criminology defined and taught? Which are the main lines of research? Which are the main schools of thought in each country? These and many other questions are answered here by fellow researchers who share their vision on the development of criminology in their countries from its beginnings to the second decade of the 21st century. If you want to know and compare their stories, stay tuned. Today we are interviewing José Cid Moline. José Cid Moline is professor at the Department of Political Science and Public Law at the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona in Barcelona in Spain. He was the principal investigator of several research projects on desistance, recidivism, criminal careers and the study of transitions from adolescence to early adulthood. This interview was conducted on the 20th of December 2022. Welcome, Jose Cid. Uh, we are very glad to have you here. So we, the idea, you know, of this podcast is to to talk about a little bit the history of, uh, of criminology in uh, in your country, uh, Spain, mm -hmm. and and perhaps then focus a little bit on what happens in particular in uh, in Catalonia. So the first question that we always uh, ask um, is, yeah, if if it is possible. How would you define criminology as it exists in Spain currently? Okay, okay. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Um, answering your question, I think criminology has experienced a big development during during the last, I could say, thirty years, maybe thirty-five years from the nineteen eight ninety from the 1990s today, until today. And I think this development is mm, very clear, especially in the question of undergraduate courses in criminology. We have already many undergraduate courses in all, in all Spain. Mm, a lot of students that do undergraduate training in criminology. Then we have also master programs in criminology. And this means that we have a lot of students doing criminology as a, as, a, as a training. This is one element. The second element of the, this development, the big development of criminology in the last 30, 35 years is related with the idea of research. I think Spain, many, there are many research groups in Spain, um, at least let's say maybe 10 big groups of criminology that do different researches in different aspects. And they have, they, it means that this is a big development comparing with the previous situation. We can talk later on this, but on, on penology, on environmental criminology, on juvenile justice, juvenile delinquency, cybercrime, many aspects that these groups are focused on. And then another aspect, maybe, probably, I think the aspect, the dimension where the criminology has had a not so big development is the in, in relation with the importance of criminology for policy. Probably in this dimension, criminology has a long road to percourse in order to be more influential in society, in, in politics. I think that's more or less the recent evolution of criminology in Spain. Yeah. I think. You mentioned these uh, research groups, and this perhaps is something that uh, you would need to explain how it works, because in other countries, for example, yeah, in Switzerland, I do research in my university with, uh, with my research team, but we are not integrated in, in, in research groups. Um, this is a particularity of Spain, and perhaps you can explain this, because there is a process of accreditation, if I am correct. Huh? 
the idea of research books is that mm, this is, I think, is very based on the idea of the how is research is founded by the government. The idea at, at the national level and also at the autonomous community level, uh, at the regional level. At the national level, the idea is uh, if you want to ask for money, then you need to present a, a, research, a research project. And normally, this research project involves a lot of scholars. The idea is that the more scholars you have in this in the project, the more chances you have to get to, to be founded. That's the idea. It means that this, this has produced that the idea of doing individual research is very difficult because you don't get money. No? And then it means that you, you need to be to have a research group, maybe incorporating different kind of scholars. For example, in my here in my university, we have a research group, and but we, we include people from criminology, people from law, people from sociology, people from psychology. It means that you have a, a group from different people, and th this is good, of course, for research because you have different dimensions, but it's also good in order to obtain the money. This is one thing. At the regional level, in the, for example, in Catalonia, but it's general in all the autonomous communities in Spain, the idea is they, they give money to research groups. They don't give money to people. They give money to research groups, and then you have money to go to conferences, to, to publications, to organize meetings. Uh, okay. This is the idea. This is, it means that the idea of the, the policy of the government is to have research groups in, in Spain. That's, I think, the ma main reason for that. Yeah. And these groups can be um, formed with people from different universities too. Yeah, this is true. You can associate with different uh, different people from different universities. There is no problem to do that. You can even you can have a program with some two levels. For example, you do one general program and you do one part, and the other part of the on the other group the, do another part. We have done this in several locations. And it's quite appreciated that you have this several alliance with other scholars. Um, we have also a, an alliance with this was an alliance that we have in the in the previous years between five universities in Spain to have a, a network. It was there is, there is also the founding for networks, research networks, and we have a network mm -hmm. with Pompeu Fabra University, one University of Castilla-La Mancha, Málaga, Barcelona. Elche. We have different universities in this network, and this was also a possibility to have some meetings between them. To have this, and this, I think, this is a good trend. The idea of, of looking for this kind of alliance between different scholars yeah. from different universities and from different subjects in the same university. But it must also be difficult to uh, manage the money because uh, the funds that you get because they go to one university. Who has to distribute them to the others? Sometimes it's problematic. Sometimes we can normally, for example, if you get this kind of coordinated programs, you you have already in the in the in the in the research proposal, you say, okay, this part of the money will go to this group, this other part will go to other yeah. group. Yeah. Normally, this is if you do a, this kind of coordination between programs, it's easier to do that. Yeah, I was surprised also also because I. Sometimes you can ask for um, 100,000 and then they give you, okay, but we'll give you 20,000. Yeah, yeah, that is a very, yeah. I think, I don't know whether exactly the details of the policy, but it's true that the, the idea is the, the government have the idea of giving money to everyone and less money instead of the other po the alternative policy that would be only to do, to do, to do money to the best projects and then give the money they have asked for. I think it's true. It's true, and I think this is a bad policy because sometimes you ask, I don't know, you ask for one hundred thousand euros, and they give you thirty thousand, and then this is very difficult to do the research in these conditions. And then, of course, they say, "Oh, you don't have. If you accept the money, if you accept the money, you need to do everything you have committed to do. This is impossible." Yeah. I mean, the only solution would be to make a budget much higher than the real one. Yeah. But this is in the limit of the ethical, the ethical no, limits. Even, no, even it's not ethical, but also it's, it can be 
um, con counterproductive because if you assess a project and you see that the the budget is um, degenerated, you have yeah, an yeah, exaggerated yeah. Uh, budget, then you you assess the project in a negative way. It means yeah. it's quite a problem. Yeah, this is quite a problem. I think the idea should be that maybe to give to the projects the money they ask in principle if not yeah. if you can give the money then it's better not to not to ask because we have this problem so not always but in some cases they give you a very few uh, a very few money and then you can do what you prom com you were committed to do that's yeah. because you don't yeah. have money you need because they, sometimes they say oh you have if you, there is five people and uh, you have already researched but and then you can do your own work you can do the field work but many times it's impossible because yeah. uh, you, as you know uh, he, the researchers are also professors are also people who manage universities this you know that the university is a very complicated issue you have management you have teaching you yeah. have research it means that maybe i remember for example we can sometimes you have an interview with uh, an ex-offender for example and the idea is you can have the interview today if you want no but i have classes then it means that you lost the interview because you don't have the yeah. assistant the research assistant that can do that immediately it means yeah. that it's quite prob the question you mentioned i think is quite problematic the idea of not giving the money the groups ask for yeah it's yeah. quite an, okay. it's quite an issue you are right it's uh, very interesting to hear this because it's a problem which uh, I recognize also in, in other European countries and not only with yeah. regard to research um, in criminology, but in general, it's, it's the basic idea of um, letting a thousand flowers bloom instead of uh, making choices. And of course, I, I can understand that it's easier from the viewpoint of the policymaker to spread the resources so that different traditions can, can grow, but if they don't have enough resources, then no tradition grows, and then basically everybody loses. So I'm wondering how we could, in the future, at least for criminology, um, change this. Um, it's important to have everybody on board, so to say, but on the other hand, um, it's it's not that, that easy. I think, Policymakers are too afraid uh, to make this kind of choices nowadays. That's my impression. I don't know. Um... I understand. I think maybe, as Martello said before, I think the the idea should be that the instead of doing so many projects, the idea is that many a lot of scholars have the same project. Could be. This is the idea to have more in, uh, researchers involved, maybe, and this having enough money to do that. This is quite, be, of course, this is more problematic, it's more difficult. You need to have the agreement with other people. Maybe the problem is that sometimes the duration is three or four years. Maybe you want to ask one project next year, but the other people is committed with a different project. It means that they are very already there are very small groups maybe the policy should be to have a big group and as big group with a very important project and ask for this money this could be this could be the solution to your point of view I, th I think this is a problem i think this is a problem and the government needs to reflect on that but also it's a question with researchers because mm -hmm. it's not only the government it's the researchers that need to have more bigger alliance bigger groups and maybe a research subject that is big enough to to in, include different researchers i think this is, could be because small groups means a small money this is even if they give you less money than you ask it this is complicated maybe that's a problem of criminology in general because um suppose we would it's just a wild idea suppose we would frame criminology as a, a health issue Governments are more willing to invest in health, and that it would be much more easy to create combinations of research groups while you still focus on crime, because crime is also a health issue. Maybe the way we try to get funding also has an impact on, on this, and maybe this may facilitate, because you're absolutely right, it's important to be interdisciplinary, so, um, but maybe trying to, to sell the concept in a broader way so that more people can identify with it would be a solution to the problem you mentioned and which I think probably exists in, in so many countries. I, I agree with you. 
Yeah, we need to have a, we need to think in a solution for that. Maybe in our European level, maybe mm -hmm. it's also an issue for the European Society of Criminology to think how is funding in Europe mm -hmm. for research. Yeah. Maybe there are some good practices in other countries that have best practices, and we need to imitate that. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean this is a, 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 an interesting issue for for the for our our project, the podcast, because. Yeah, it's quite different from one country to the other. For for example, in France, there is uh, this um, foundation, this uh, center for uh, for research. In Switzerland, there is the Swiss National Science Foundation. You know that are like uh, independent bodies, financed by the government, but com but uh, independent. And then I don't know. I think that in Spain, it is the Ministry of Education who deals with this. There is also an uh, an special agency. We, I think there is an, uh, I don't know, I don't remember now the agency, but there is a special agency that have the the funds for, funds for, for this. I think it's a, we have also a special agency yeah. for that. But for example, I don't think it's different with, I don't think it's different with other countries. It's more, or it's more the idea of ha giving money to everyone and the small money instead yeah. of founding more specific projects with big groups, I think would be. But focus on research, not, um, I think this could be a solution for that, maybe. Yeah, but you know, the fact that we, I, I don't know the name either eh, uh, of this agency. It's uh, called it's, the Agencia Nacional de Investigación. Yeah, but it, it's already an indicator that it doesn't play a major role. Because if you if you talk with someone in Switzerland, they would say, ah, the Swiss National Science Foundation. Uh, and if you talk with the French, they would say the the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique. It's like uh, you you identify with this, and the, the difference is that the French, they have researchers attached to the centre, while the Swiss, they do not have it. It's, I don't know which is the best system, eh? but it's, um, it's something that could be uh, that could be discussed. We have also, we have also, as you know, maybe in Spain there is also the share, or another institution, the people who is doing only research in the Centro Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas. Yeah. And, and these people only do research. And they, you can be professor of this or researcher in this institution. You mm -hmm. don't do teaching, you only do research. I don't think there are, uh, you remember, there are uh, these in different subjects in this area. I don't think there is a subject in this scientific center that is uh, devoted to criminology. They, they are in sociology, of course, in many, many aspects, but of course, criminology is a even in Spain is an, a new subject already, it's already a new subject, we don't have this. I think we have the agency. Every every research in Spain know that the, the, the it can change, but the Agencia Nacional de Investigación, you know that is, it's true that it, we call this the Ministry of Science. Okay, but yeah. this, the agency exists and this is, I don't think this is the problem. We know that this, that this is the place to ask for money, when you have a project, I think yeah. this at the at the national level, that there, there is the of course there is the European Union. This is another okay. agency to to look for found for yeah. funds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we took a little bit of our research, and and you mentioned some of the programs of education in criminology, and mm -hmm. just to to arrive to the present, let's start by the past. What where would you place the origins of criminology in in Spain? In Spain, the origins of, um, uh, I could say that is looking for the, probably the more recent ones, you remember that in Spain there was the influence of the the positive school of Lombroso. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has influence in Spain. We have a, very, a big tradition of scholars, of uh, scholars and in, the, in the positivist tradition. You, it's called the correctionalist school. La Escuela Correccionalista, the Correctional School, it was very relevant. It was in the, in the, 90, at the end of the 19th century, the, the 20th century, with uh, very good scholars, Dorado Montero, Concepción Arenal, afterwards Jiménez de Azúa, Bernardo de Quirós. There was a, a tradition, there was a, and before, Salillas before of that, there was a, a tradition of scholars in this tradition of positive school. This is something I don't know. Um, and I think many of our listeners will also be interested to 
to know about this. Earlier, many people, many scholars wrote in their native language. So in Belgium, we wrote in, in Dutch, in Spain, you wrote in Spanish. And Spanish, yeah. so for the original um, studies, it's quite difficult to reconstruct the history. So all these um, names of professors, um, what were the subjects? Uh, you talk about um, the positivist school. Does that mean um, social defense, uh, la défense sociale? Um, or I don't know how to... I... Yeah, 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 yeah. It was the name. If you want to know to know have a name, the name is Correccionalistas. Okay. Correctional school. The difference with positivistic is that they they will. You remember that in the in the idea of the in Lombroso Ferry, there was always this idea that th this um, debate on whether there was some um, offenders that were not incorrigible is the way in English, yeah, and yeah. other ways you can correct them. Okay, the difference with correccionalistas in Spain is that they consider that every offender was able to be reformed. They they were more in favor of reform, and and it was a it was a very good school. They did they were more an ideological school than a scientific school. But in this moment, criminology was more doing as a it was more much more based as a practical uh, field that a theoretical field that a empirical field okay but we have a, this we have this big tradition of scholars the problem in spain came with the civil war mm -hmm. you remember that in 1936 1939 spain suffered a civil war after that there was the many of these scholars were more um, yeah, identify with the Republican, and then they lost the war, and and they need to be ex in exile, and it means that many of these scholars went to South America, especially to Jimenez de Azúa is the case. Many scholars then to there they work in the uh, South American universities in the United Nations, then in Europe some of them, but the question is that criminology lost his. As met, not only criminology, but many other aspects of the scientific um, field, the tradition was completely broken. And then I think this tradition has re the criminology restarted after democracy. That's the problem with this tradition of criminology, that we suffer these 40 years in which criminology was very absent of the of the there was no studies of criminology Crimi, even criminal law professors the criminal law professors the ones who were more interested in criminology most of them were outside of spain it means that, that the only Jimenez de Azúa that was of course the, the penologist but the, the, he was also very important for criminology he did his, I remember the PhD was on, on the on prevention measures. It was also all, it means they have a, a lot of interest in, a lot of interest in criminology. The other scholars they have been influenced on, they need to go outside of Spain on exile. It means that this tradition was lost. And then we, we, we after these years, we have the, the new times of, that is the recent one I explained it before. But we have a tradition of criminology, of course, in Spain. Some scholars have, I think, for example, Alfonso Serrano, in, in uh, a scholar in, in Madrid, has done kind of, uh, has tried to, to, this idea you said before, that the idea of trying to make visible this uh, history of criminology that is very local because, it's, of course, it's in Spanish, but of course it exists. In particular, if we take, okay, Alfonso, he did that in, I cannot remember the name of his book, because the, maybe if you remember. Some kind of Historia de la Criminología Española, something like that. Yeah. I don't remember, but I think. Okay, it's but it's, it is like that. Okay, yeah. For example, some of them that uh, deserve to be mentioned, Luis Jiménez de Azúa, for example. Huh? So he was from uh, from Madrid. And then he was involved in the um, in politics uh, uh, with the Socialist Party, and then he spent thirty years, I think, in in Argentina. Eh? So he um, he left uh, when at the end of the Civil War, but he he was even the president of the Republic in exile for uh, until his exactly. death in nineteen seventy. So there is um, there is like a strong. Um, 
link there with um, with politics. I have not here, but at the office I have like uh, his complete works. It's like twelve volumes or something, exactly. uh, something like that. It is quite it is quite impressive, and uh, this was completely forgotten because his his lines of Do you think that he he left a legacy in, in Argentina? Yes, because uh, Basigalupo, many of the of course, the... they have a legacy. For example, yeah, yeah. In Spain, they they have different scholars that ha most of them they went to exile. But in Spain, it, we have, for example, um, one important criminal law professor is um, Jose Antonio Neca, also um, Cuello Calón. Cuello Calón was also yeah. stay, stay in Spain. Both of them has making studies on penology Cuello yeah. Calón and, and, and Antonio Neca. But Antonio Neca, for example, did, did a lot of, um, he, did, he is very famous for his uh, criminal law textbook, that is very good, but also because he has done many works on historic historical works, trying to reconstruct the idea of the correctional school to the giving some papers to different professors like Professors of the correctionalist school, they have, have done different, and this 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 tradition, of course, existed. For example, I remember that uh, imagine the he did a very nice work, Jimenez de Azu. I think he went to, I uh, Antonio Neca. I think he went to Suiza, is is your country, to Switzerland. He went there to study the because it was very famous in at this time the idea of the um, judicial pardon mm -hmm. as a way to solve. And, and he spent some time there studying this this new institution. It was very famous ah. in Switzerland. And it means that we have this tradition. Jimenez de Azua has a lot of, of discipulos. Of course, criminology, if Jimenez de Azua has remained in Spain, yeah. we have the idea that we have doubt because they were, they think that criminal law was not only doing specific juridical work, was also were more a field, was a more, broad field in, that includes criminology yeah. but all of this tradition was completely broken after the civil war and then we need to wait 40 years to reconnect with the past that's the idea yeah. and i yeah. think what is, is what we did after the democracy is what criminal spanish criminology did after democracy trying to connect with the previous tradition that existed in spain in the in the at the beginning of the 20th century, and of course, with the and before. That Apart. must yeah. have been very difficult to re establish all the contacts. It must have been a strong endeavor. We, I think it was difficult. I think it, after democracy, the first thing we need to do is trying to connect people in Spain that were doing criminology in different subjects for people from the law, people with a law background, people from a sociology background, psychology. All of these people need to be needs to be together. The first question we did uh, in Spain was trying to to connect these, per these people, and we did that. That's where the, This is the origin of the Spanish Society of Criminology. Okay. Then we have, of course, the, the, we, the connection with Europe came thanks to the European Society of Criminology. But before we have the connection with between Spanish people, Spanish criminology that did, this is the basis for the foundation of the Spanish Society of Criminology that was done in the I don't remember, but in the 90s, at the end of the 90s, and then we have this, the European Society of Criminology that was more or less in the same time that we have the international connections. This is the, the, the way we were able to reconstruct criminology in Spain. In Spain. I, I, I think, okay, we talk about Jimenez de Azua. It's interesting that he was head of the Institute of Criminology at the University of Buenos Aires, until 1966, another coup d'etat, another uh, when, when the militaries took the power in 1966, and he also had the um, Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology, Revista de Derecho Penal y de Criminología, that he directed until his death. So he played a major role, although it's difficult for me to give to tell this is one idea of Jiménez de Azúa. The idea of Jiménez de Azúa was more, you remember that he's very known, but El Tratado, is six volumes like an encyclopedia i think this was the idea the idea of having produce like trying to to explain all the knowledge we have in this in this six volumes of 
the treaty how you call tratado in english i don't know the name a in treaty english. a treaty a treaty, a treaty of criminal law is a tratado de derecho penal yeah a treaty of criminal law and it was everything there this yeah. is the, this was the idea and maybe he thought he this was very important for for scholars for trying yeah. to to di disseminate the knowledge we have on, on yeah. the, this was this idea he was his his aim in life i think he was a man that he has many dimensions he, uh, as, as you said before when in in his period he was the person who who has more influence in the spanish constitution he he has a lot of political responsibilities everything means that there was this kind of man that was interested in 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 science in research but also in politics they mean they have a very intense life it yeah. was it was a different type kind of person yeah. one thing that uh, yeah let's say shocked me a little bit is that uh, i bought the whole um, works of jimenez de Azúa in peru uh, because I couldn't find it easily in Spain. Eh? And even I, I tried once to find the PDF files. And Difficult, I, yeah. Yeah, but this is something that the Instituto Cervantes, for example. But they I have, do. but we have, for example, the vol. Of course, in my university, if we look. If you enter to the, to the, to my university, they have. We have all the volumes of the Tratado de Derecho at, Penal, of course. At the, at the library, yes. In the library, of course. For example, this is something that uh, for the Spanish Society of Criminology could be a, a project, you know, to digitalize this source of knowledge because it must be in the public domain. Eh? And and I think just to, to look at, at just two two more names I would like to mention today maybe Constancio Bernaldo de Quiroz, who had to who went to exile to Mexico in this case most of them exactly. went to Argentina or Mexico eh? these are the two countries and he also was engaged in criminology already in um, yeah, in Spain eh? he yes. was yeah he was the directing an institute of criminology at that time. Eh? All of these people were, all of them were very important. All, Jimenez de Azúa was a very important person. Probably was the intellectual, the more relevant intellectual, at least in the law, the field in, in the Republic. And they, he, has, yeah. he's very, and he has a very big school uh, with many, yeah. many people. All the, it was very relevant. Of yeah. I, I'm cheating because I'm working, uh, I'm looking on Wikipedia to increase because, of course. yeah, it's 1899 when they created the Laboratory of Criminology with Giner exactly. de los Rios. And Giner de los Rios was the person, one of the, this, Giner de los Rios was the correctionalist leader. He was, a, is, it is the, the father of the correctionalist, the idea of correctionalist. Yeah. One funny thing, because uh, Lieben mentioned the translations, uh, I remember that I saw one of his books, La Mala Vida in Madrid, and this is also, I think, in, in si, your si. library. At the, and this was translated si, to this was translated to German. Now I have learned that uh, the introduction was written by Lombroso. It's quite impressive, and I I don't want to make a mistake, but I think that um, I think that Quiroz was also translated to English. I'm almost sure, but uh, okay, this I will check. Yeah. Uh, I think because so. he has a book about the new, it's called like the new theories, eh? which is written. It's funny because it's uh, one century ago. But uh, I think he is important. And maybe because you work especially in the field of corrections, maybe a, a proto criminologist in Spain. I think Concepcion Arenal eh? is the most famous. She's also very. She's very relevant. Also, he wrote a book. It's called El Visitador del Preso. How you call in English the the, the, the prison visitor? The, exactly the prison yeah. visitor. This is an amazing book from the 19th century, in the second part of the 19th century. Yeah. And he, she was uh, she was a person who has a philosophy of corrections, or in favor of correctionalism. He, one of the, his famous sentences is, "Odia el delito y compadece al delincuente." Hate the crime, give compassion to the offender. This is quite an important sentence. Yeah. And he was, this is a question of his, her philosophy. He was yeah. very active doing this kind of promoting that you need to go to the prisons, visiting, going to the redemption work in prisons, but not only the redemption, but also help to people in order that they, they was very in favor of 
redemption, thinking that anyone can be. And this was a very good philosophy. This, of course, it has relation with positivists, but they were more, much more in favor of rehabilitation. That because, in, in as you know, in, in in the work of Lombroso, especially, yeah. some of people they think no, they are not positive. They are not able to be corrected. They are not not. And he has a, they yeah. have a different idea. And it, it, this is a book. This is a very a very relevant book in Spanish penology. Daily. And I think it's very actual. Very today, I think at least I like it. This book, I think they, it was. It has been. This book has an, an influence because it has a new editions very recently. I think. I think there is even a book. Uh, 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 there is even a, a film on that. I think maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. there is something like they have done something on that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very Christian principle. So of um, course, and it's funny because restorative justice. It's the same idea, eh? <laughs> because religious, as you know, Marcelo is very related with uh, everything related with rehabilitation. Yeah. Uh, probation in England or uh, in the States is based on it was founded by religious organizations. Today, the reentry programs in the States are based. Many of them are based on religious. In Spain, the most of the institutions that go to do mentoring and volunteer in prison is done by religious institutions. It's, it continues to be very important, the idea, because religious people think that one of the duties they have is going to the prisons and, go, and trying to help people that, has, that are in a, yeah. in a problematic yeah, it's, situation. It's quite interesting because she died. Uh, again, I'm cheating because I don't have the, the in my mind the dates. I'm, I'm just looking. She died in 1893. She was 73. So. Probably she never even read Lombroso because uh, it was not yet, uh, you know, 1893. I think he has, she has, she should have read Lombroso because Lombroso was trans. I don't know whether it was translated into Spanish. I think so. It was translated. I I read I read the Italian version, but I think some of the books of Lombroso should have been translated into Spanish. Maybe you can be able to look at that. Yeah, but, but I think I, he, they were familiar with the idea of. I think they should be familiar. I don't know. Uh, 1876 is the first edition, and she died in, 19, in 1893, but she was quite old already because she was from 1820. This is something that perhaps we should uh, investigate, if there was really a, a link. Huh? Uh, but it's funny also that um, in Spanish-speaking countries, when you use the word positivist, uh, it has like a, like a negative um, connotation. Eh? Not in Spain, I would say no. Not in Spain. Don't you think in Spain? No. I have the impression that always positive is, is uh, Lombroso. And, uh, and, uh, the positive school, mm, it, as you know, the positive school has has different faces. <laughs> exactly. That's the, that's. The as, but this is also no. This is even in in in, in other. Uh, even if, for example, I, I think this is a sentence from Francis Kuhl Callen in the book of criminology, he said that he has different faces. If you look at eugenetics, yeah. of course, it's also uh, related with, with eugenetics, is related with the positive school. Uh, this is the bad face. If you look at rehabilitation, this is the good face. Yeah. It has different faces. That's good. You can look at one aspect you can look at another one depends on the, what you like it but i yeah. think they have different faces and another thing is the relation with biological theories in now that it's, it's a different issue yeah no it, it's true it's the relation with determinism i think that's not only for biological but also sociological and psychological positivism it's just the, the difference between the 19th century early uh, schools which were really focusing on determinism, while determinism had this fatalistic meaning. And I think exactly. the fatalistic meaning disappeared because exactly. even biology, we can overcome our genes. If I don't want to have kids, I don't have kids, even while humans have this disposition to, I mean, make some children once in their life because otherwise the species would <laughs> disappear. But we can overcome our genes. We can make decisions not to do things. So determinism has lost its original meaning. So. There is no danger anymore in, in biology or in psychology or in doing this kind of research. I think the, it has many faces, and I think we still have the, I mean, the idea of some people still have the idea of the, the bad phase of positivism because of all the, the abuse. But we should not forget that 
other schools were also the basis for abuse. Uh, I know that sociological positivism has been abused mm -hmm. also by totalitarian regimes to to make people believe in certain ideologies. Just um, so it's indeed um, a tradition with many faces. And then I, I like the book by by Cullen. You you mentioned it's a, a great discussion on on all the different schools. So we, we saw a little bit uh, the, the, the beginnings, um, then then there is the civil war, let's say something st stops there, and then there is the renaissance of um, of criminology that doesn't arrive immediately because, uh, yeah, Franco dies in 75, the first government, socialist government is 1982, and then it took until the 1990s a little bit to, uh, to rebuild a little bit this, huh? Exactly, and 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 you and you have played a role there in the institutionalization of of criminology in Spain because there were like mm -hmm. three different periods that maybe perhaps you could explain to us. Yeah, the idea is that I would say in the nineties, maybe in the, at the end of the eighties, nineteen eighties, there was, I think, an interest in criminology. I remember, at least from my personal experience, that is important. I remember we have the. I, I was a law student in the Faculty of Law, and means in the 1979, 90, and I remember that there was a Spanish professor, Roberto Bergali. You have now about him. He was a um, criminologist in Barcelona. Trump. From Argentina, eh? from Argentina, and but he was in Spain, and he has with he. They have different as uh, Argentinian professors that after the dict that when they quit the dictatorship, they they were they moved to Europe and they were um, accepted or uh, they were, they have a posi they get a position in Spain. Yeah. Roberto Bergali, Bacigalupo, Bustos, yeah. no? all of these professors have. Um, and they have, of course, they came from Argentina, and, and they have an interest in criminology because they have the tradition yeah. to get our professors. But, but, the, but the tradition that was brought by the Spanish, I mean, this the Spanish, exactly. Changed. They came and they it's came quite to, impressive. And they, and they came. I remember this. They came to Barcelona, and I was a four-year student in the law faculty, and I. Some people said, "Oh, there is a professor that is organizing a seminar in criminology." I have the idea of criminology as a, of course, I know that there exists criminology because in the criminal law they say something about criminology, but I don't, I don't have real knowledge. I like it, the subject, but I, I wanted to know more. And I remember that we asked at least 20 people were to this uh, criminology seminar that was completely free, it's not for grades, for anything. And we started to have an interest in criminology. There was this professor, Bergali, Bustos, and and in Barcelona, there were other people interested in criminology. Maite Miralles, maybe you remember, there were other people that... And they started to have the idea of giving the idea of criminology to some young people. And, of course, after this, and this was in the, in the 70s, at the beginning of the democracy. And, of course, we started with criminology, at least with the interest in criminology. Of course, not with research in criminology. This came yeah. later, when you get a position, when you can have money for research. But we have the interest in criminology already in the 70s. And this for the law people. Of course, there was other people that, for uh, uh, other people that, that arrived to criminology, this was the people that work in prisons. And this was maybe psychologists. Imagine, in the case of Spain, the most famous is Santiago Redondo. Yeah. Santiago Redondo was a initially he was he was doing a he get a position he get a, a profession in prison he was psy, prison psychologist and then and he, he after that he get involved in as a position and of course he has knowledge on psychology he was interested in rehabilitation and there was other kind of people that because of the interest in because of working in prisons and because of interest in psychology they get there, there was another influence for criminology and then we have some people maybe 
few people that was interested in sociology and they were doing some kind of imagine in Barcelona, for example, in the you remember, maybe you don't remember, but in Barcelona in the 80s, there it was we have a lot of problems with crime in the 80s and as similar in other places, but in Barcelona, especially in some areas, the all part of Barcelona, there was like a, a very serious situation. I remember Plaza Real that Marcelo, you know Plaza Real in Barcelona. Yeah, yes, it, it was, was. A, it was a, a drug market. Yeah, you can find drug market, open market, like yeah, you go to a market. It was the same. Maybe and, for the person who are following Plaza Real is at 100 meters from the Ramblas. Exactly. It's a major location now. If if they make images of Barcelona, they show this. It appears in many pictures, so it's very difficult to imagine a, a black market. So in the middle of the city, you know, it's uh, yeah, yeah. And we have in this area therefore there was um, drugs, prostitution, crime, everything related. No, it was like a ghetto in the city. And the the new democracy means also that we have democratic city councils. It means they want to renew the city, and they have, uh, of course, they have the interest in how you renew the city. And there was the sociologists that have this interest in criminology too, in how to to produce, to reduce crime and and and, uh, and other kind of ex activities, antisocial activities in the city. There was another another influence for criminology. It means we have the law people with with this tradition of the the tradition of criminology in Spain, coming back to the tradition that Jiménez de Azúa with the mediation of these Argentinian professors coming back, coming back, or Ch Chilean professors coming back to Barcelona, that was one tradition, or to Spain. And then we have the, the people from psychology, from prisons. Then we have some sociology people. And maybe, oh, there was other people, maybe other psychologists working in, I remember one in Galicia working with young offenders. But all of these people, they were working not with no relation between ones and others. And then we have the, this first connection. I think Elena Rauri did a seminar in Barcelona. I think it was 1997. It, he did a seminar inviting different people from different areas. And we met and after this meeting, I think the, there were all the developments. This was very important, trying to make, uh, to make the people. This was the origins of the Spanish Society of Criminology that has been very successful afterwards yeah it was so the it, recent re, the recent idea of course there was other aspects then there was the question the political the importance of having a degree in criminology this was also based on uh, this was, there was a, the lobby of the criminologists also people from the law criminal law asking to the government to accept that criminology should have there could be a, an undergraduate studies studies in criminology it was also important and at, this was all the, the new, the, the renaissance, as you said, Marcelo, of criminology in Spain. Yeah. In the, after, the, after the democracy, it was a question of democracy. Yeah. It takes yeah. time, but it started in democracy. Maybe just to put some order, the, the civil war is 36 to 39. Then many people immigrated to Argentina and Mexico. And then Franco dies in 75. In 73, it's the coup d'etat in Chile. Pinochet takes the power. Some people have to go to exile. In 76 is the coup d'etat in Argentina, and then people go to exile. And 77 is the first elections in uh, in Spain. So this there is this movement of crossing the Atlantic on one side of the other. Uh, and so if you if we think a little bit about what you mentioned about crime in the 80s, but it's funny because um, the, for example Bergali. Uh, he was always a critical criminologist, and uh, I'm not sure that they would, um, which were the concrete actions to be taken, because for the, for them, the logic is, is the system that is rotten, and then you have to change the system. As you said, you mentioned the first, uh, inf uh, in the 80s, as you, we have a big influence of critical criminology in Spain. I think uh, the, it was the first criminology we listened, the first criminology. I remember uh, in this seminar I mentioned to you with Roberto Bergali, we have as a, the textbook of the seminar was the book of Barata, Criminologia, Criti, Criti, Criminologia Critica y Critica del Derecho Penal. 
you remember this book. This was the, 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 the this was the this was the handbook of the seminar, um, but it, it was a way to to learn criminology, at least theoretical criminology, with this book. And uh, of course, we have a lot of re remember that there was a relation. Critical criminology was quite quite organized in Europe at this moment because there was this common study program. And we belong to this program with, uh, with on the one hand, it was Spain, Barcelona, there was the, the Italians, Bologna, Roberto Maximo Pogarini, um, Melosi was in, in America, but was also there. Then we have the Germans with Barata. Then we yeah. have the, the English people with the, the Middlesex, with Taylor, Jock Young, Roger Matthews. Ruggiero, many people. It yeah. was the, the, the importance of critical criminology and the international. It was a national. The international connection was big. It, it means this was at least for not for not for everyone. For the law people, this was the influence of critical criminology. Not for the psychologists that was completely out of this idea. They was more related with what was movement. No. Yeah. This is the, on the sociology, it was other dimension. But for the law people, of course, critical criminology in the 80s in Spain was quite relevant, of course. It's good. Mm -hmm. to, I didn't know that uh, Barata's book was the, um, the textbook. Yeah. Yeah. Now I understand better the reaction when I wrote that critical article that led to the book. Uh, but that's another story. Maybe one day we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so. Concretely, because criminology, crime, there was this problem of crime in uh, in the mm -hmm. 80s. I um, I would say that probably criminology, in the way it was presented at the time, did not help a lot to um, solve this problem. Do you think it solved by itself? Probably thanks to the in the increase of the the level of life after entering the European Union. What do you think about that? But let me say before that, of course, I remember when I was a student of criminology in the 80s, that I read all of these things about critical criminology. And then we saw that the crime was quite relevant because it was, it was very clear that in Barcelona we have a lot of crime. And I agree with you that there was no a clear answer of critical criminology to this. This is, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. But the government, yes, it takes action. For example, in Barcelona, the idea of Maragai, that was the first major in this uh, in this time, he take action in with the to to do a new plan in Barcelona. And of course, uh, they they did a lot of things. Mm, the explanation for the this increasing crime in the 70s, 80s, and also the explanation for the decreasing crime in the 90s is quite it continues to be an issue in criminology. What is the, there are many explanations. I don't think there is a specific reason to say what happens in Spain that the crime um, was reduced. The more easy answer would be you know, that the Spains have a big problem with um, drugs. Drugs. Big problem. One of the the crimes that was very relevant was robbery. Robbery uh, was uh, an important crime in the eighties. We have a a real um, problem with uh, with this. Of course, um, most of these uh, subjects, uh, most of these persons, um, they I should not remember. They have a lot of people in prison. Then there was people do, who died for that. And then, of course, heroin was. Uh, then there was AIDS. Many things that changed very much the use of this kind of drug that was very. This the idea of the idea that that heroin tend to disappear, it was relevant from the, from the, uh, but I don't know, of course, they, you can say there are many reasons, other reasons, but I don't, it's difficult to say explanation of what were, were the reasons for the increasing crime in, during this period and the decrease of crime afterwards. Yeah. I'm not I, able, to, I'm not able to answer to that in a very, in a good way. Yeah, I think Spain is quite interesting because it has a different story. The only country that you could, could, could compare is Portugal. But Spain, due to the dictatorship and the the way in which it developed, it, it arrived late to all of these things. I, I remember, I think it's Amadeo Recasanzi Brunet that says that uh, the, the welfare state uh, lived in 10 years, what it lived in 30 years in other places. Huh? 
because for this, and I, I know that we will not find the solution to this because what we saw in Switzerland with the heroin prescription programs is that uh, heroin addicts were not really involved in robbery because the kind of drug, you know, heroin relaxes the person. So it, unless they are really in need of, uh, of drugs, then they may get violent, but usually they are not. So I think it's a little bit more complicated than... Um, I think the improvement of the economic situation must have played a role, so, which is contrary to what uh, what Barata was saying, because he was saying this is the problem of the capitalist society. When the capitalist society will disappear, uh, it would be better. And indeed, Spain became more capitalist or more free economy, and the situation improved. But this is just a correlation. I'm not saying it's the yeah, the, yeah. the cause. Eh? But uh, yeah, it's, it's surprising. And one thing that always... Um, it's a mystery for me. You mentioned Maragall, who was the, the, the major of Barcelona. He also launched the, the, the victimization survey. And my question is, do you know who was there? Who gave him the idea of a victimization survey? I think that, yeah, yeah, they have sociologists. As you know, Maragall was able to have with him the best people in Catalonia. That's very important. Best people in in the in all the fields who are working with him, and he has sociologists that they have the idea of doing this kind of victimization. They they were able. They they were in relation. You, Maragai was very much in relation with this. He's an anglophile, and he was very much in. He has spent some time in England, I think, in some universities. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Maybe I'm Belgian, yeah, yeah. but I think they ha has an influence. I don't know whether in England or in America, but I imagine the sociologists, they know that they were doing that in, in other places in England. And, and of course, he has the idea. He was very concerned with crime. That's differently. Uh, this was very different with critical criminology because in the professors of criminology, they maybe they were different in England. You remember the in the in Taylor well, Young they wrote the the book uh, critical the second book yeah. critical criminology and the idea is the real the realistics the idea of uh, crime is relevant because it affects to the working class yeah. we need to be aware of crime he was a change it means and maybe uh, Maragai was not uh, I don't know whether he has a, a, a knowledge on criminology but the sociologists that they were the people who were doing this kind of the first. Uh, yeah, they have this idea. They have, I imagine they have international connections with and and and, and they know that they the crime was relevant. That's the crime was relevant. Maragai is very I don't know who was exactly the mentor of Maragai, but it's clear that he has the idea that crime was a relevant aspect to solve in the city. Yeah. And the funny thing is that the change, I mean Young changed his idea because he started doing empirical research. He, they, they, he had these surveys in, in the city of London, exactly. and then he looked at the figures and said there's something wrong. It's funny that Barata writes uh, quite after that. He published in 1982, but he takes the ideas of 73. He takes, he's inspired by the, the new criminology, but not by the second book. It's um, like he... It, it, my critique was that he he went back nine years when uh, after uh, Solzhenitsyn has published Gulag Archipelag. So, uh, so I was a little bit surprised. It was like a, there was like a sort of delay there, maybe due to the fact that there was less connections with the international um, field. No. I don't know. He was connected because we, as you, as I said to you, we have this kind of Erasmus program, and we met twice. Year. Yeah. And in the seminars, there was the English were there, Barata was there, everyone. He knew very, I think he was, he was critics, critic with the, the new realism of the, the ah. I, think was, he, I think he liked, because he was most in favor of uh, abolitionism, yeah. some other, there was also, you remember, there was also in this group, there was Dutch people, yeah. Luke Hulsman, yeah. Herman Bianchi, they were also involved in this group. In the, and this group, these people was more, much more in favor of the idea of, of reductionism. Of there was also, and this, they, they were much, much in this idea, less concerned by, not very happy with, with the idea of crime prevention was not the main issue. They were more yeah. concerned with the idea of the criticism to the criminal law, to the effects of the prison, and more in favor of the idea of 
aboli abolitionism in this moment. Yeah. And even the Spanish feminist criminologies that I knew from this period, they were also abolitionists. Everything related with critical criminology in the 80s was very much. Remember, this This was the people that we have as an international people. They were Luke Hulsman, Herman Bianchi, in Italy, Ferraioli. All the, the our, ref, our intellectual reference were these people. They were the relevant people in Spain in the 80s. Yeah. And also Luke Hulsman for it. Luke Hulsman, of course. Yeah. I met personally all of these people. Luke Hulsman, Herman Bianchi, um, of course, Barata, Pavarini, every, every the, all the English, everyone I met them. And they were very influential. Fritz Sack in Germany, many of the, of all of them. They came, they came very oh, frequently to Barcelona because the Bergali and Bustos, all of these Spanish professors, are, People came from uh, or, uh, Argentina or Chilean professor. They 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 organize a lot of big conference in Barcelona, and we have all of these people yeah. there. And where are they now? That because now Spain is producing a lot of new laws. Um, all these abolitionists, because I, I mean, I don't recognize the 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 the, 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 the movement. You, yeah, no. tell me. Because I think. The, you remember, you know, Marcelo, that there is this uh, restorative justice, mm -hmm. and this restorative justice has been very influential, and they give more specific um, solutions because they, they be, uh, the restorative justice has produced the idea of mediate, victim offender mediation programs, it ha they have produced uh, com family conferences, and this seems more much practical, as, with very more clear implications. Then they have a new scholars, John Braithwaite. It has, it, of course, it's quite more uh, Lauren Sherman. They have more, more people that have produced more theoretical knowledge and they have replaced. Restorative justice is the replacement for... And then we have reductionist policies, the, the, because abolitionist was abolish this has been too radical but then there is the other policy the reductionist policies and reductionist policies regarding prison has been an official policy is that is now it has been the policy of the european of the council of europe all the recommendations of the council of europe are very much are based on the idea that prison should be the last resort of and course. The alternative should be the normal answer all these two principles it means that some of the ideas of the of the critical criminology Today are ideas of the main, mainstream ideas of the uh, European level. Yeah, but uh, as we're talking about Spain, because uh, I, I mean, I do a lot of work with the Council of Europe, and well, I'm not sure that the idea of reducing prison came only from critical criminology. I think uh, testing, not only, not yeah, only, but yeah, yeah, but, testing what works and what doesn't uh, um, was also from post positive criminal post positive criminology, but. Uh, in Spain currently, you know, the, the trend to introduce new laws, to change the, the to, in, to introduce new uh, crimes and, uh, and harsher penalties, I, I don't see what you mentioned at the beginning of this discussion that uh, criminology did not have a lot of impact on criminal policy. Although in 2010 there was this reform and there was at least one criminologist there, but I don't see now the debate. Of course, I, I understand it's quite difficult to enter in the debate saying the logical thing, which is don't put the punishment too long because then you will fill the prisons. Eh? But I, I don't see a reaction of to the punitivist feeling that I get. Maybe I'm wrong. Eh? No, I think you are right. I think the Spanish criminology community is, is of course, is against this trend in general, but it's very small. Yeah. It's not power. It's, he has, he, it's not enough power to to have an influence that's the, as in the my in the beginning of my conversation i said that probably the step that uh, criminology needs to to take is the idea of having more influence on politics yeah and i think it's not it's not already even in other countries because i remember we have here the we have here the other day uh, tony bottoms in our in our university and he said that the same that even in england the criminology has a lot of whether of course criminology is much more influent has more much more influence than in spain in politics but even there the home office 
ask for reports from criminologists from Cambridge, etc. But if you don't, maybe some reports they don't like it. They don't take in, they don't take into account. <laughs> when they did the when they did exactly the research, Cambridge did the research on on the severity of sentences, saying that the, the, the severity of sentence is not good for for preventing crime. They dislike and they don't take into into account. Yeah, it means criminology. I don't think it's only. In, of course, in Spain, it's very problematic. That we don't have uh, as a criminology is not is not powerful to have this influence. But I think it's more a general problem in in Europe, at least yeah. in some countries. Not every maybe the idea of this. We need a more powerful criminology, but very at least I think in Spain we need more criminologists. Okay, and then. Okay, to close a little bit the idea of uh, education, from what I remember, when I when I went the first time to Spain, they there were these titles given by each university that were called uh, titulos propios. Then there was a moment when there was a license. That there I was already collaborating uh, uh, with you in the autonomous university, and then the the last step was the creation of the undergraduate program of four years and the master of one year. Eh? So all this happened in in one decade, more or less, eh? or maybe 15 years. I think that, for example, our master, the master of criminology, and we the, maybe it was un, one of the first programs in Spain in criminology, it started in 90, 1988. Yeah, but that was a master, like a postgraduate degree. Postgraduate, yeah, in the yeah. Sense, yeah. And then we yeah. have in 2004, 2004, it was you need to have a three years of university and then you have two years of, of criminology. Yeah. And then we have criminology was a, was a, like two years after three, after three years of undergraduate. And then yeah. we, in 2009, we have finally, we have the actual situation that is undergraduate, undergraduate degree in criminology. Yeah. This yeah, is, was in 2009. Yeah, it's a terminology that is confusing because. Uh, but I'm sorry for the. Yeah. No, no, it's a, but it's uh, for me also. I mean, it's not uh, not not your problem. But uh, yeah, the well, these postgraduate degrees, the, which now would be a master of second level in some places, that you started already, as you mentioned, and at the end of the 1980s, that is still going on. Exactly. Uh, but then, then there was this idea because Spain had a system of three plus two with what's called diploma and, li and license, which is the common system of Bologna. But then when the rest of the world entered into Bologna, Spain, instead of keeping three plus two, went to four plus one. It was four quite four interesting, four. yeah? And then, okay, the undergraduate and the master, and the, the master that you had before that was a master of second degree became a master of first degree, let's say, in the sense of, of Bologna. So it, there was a lot of changes in a, in a very short period of time. And I wonder now, knowing that criminology is being taught everywhere, eh, how many criminologists, I mean, who is teaching criminology apart from the 20 or 30 people that go every year to the European site of criminology that created the, the SEIC? Uh, I have the impression that a lot of persons from criminal law and other disciplines entered uh, and maybe I know it's I know it's a difficult question, and you don't need to answer if you don't want to. But I mm -hmm. I see a lot of differences in the levels of um, how demanding are the studies in different universities. It's a little bit uh, politically incorrect as a question, but uh, okay. We, regarding the first question, this is difficult to say. We need to. I don't exactly know the numbers of each university. Uh, you know the you, you know the system in our university. The question is, we have a, a undergraduate in criminology, but we have people from different. We, I have nine departments in my in, in the degree of criminology. It means we have law people that teach of the, all the law subjects, criminal law, procedural law, etc. Then we have people from sociology that teach methods. All the methods are taught by sociology people. Then we have people from geography that teach um, environmental criminology. That is important because uh, uh, geographical information systems, all of this. Then we have people from psychology that teach um, some intervention programs with rehabilitation programs. They teach, of course, the psychology, all of this. Then we have people from medicine that teach 
means drugs and crime that teach, for example, psychiatric problems and crime. It means we have many department, many people doing criminal, and I think it's I don't know whether this is the trend of the, but it's not law people. Law people has, of course, they teach criminal law, procedural law. Some of the subjects that are taught in criminology can be, you can have the cooperation of the sociology people, people from other departments, psychology, sociology, pedagogy, education also. But of course, you need some people that has more specialization in criminology. I don't know whether there are, but maybe we have in this, in my university is a very big university with many, many people. And it's not difficult to find, I don't know, gender violence, because of course we have people that is, do, is doing research on gender violence, juvenile justice. May, and in, if we have problems to find someone in the university that is doing, that we don't have one specializing in juvenile delinquency, of course, we go to another place and maybe we have uh, some other people that can be here to do that. I think we are able, I, I imagine that most universities are doing more or less the same process. It means not only, we have also incorporating in our grade, in our, in our studies, we are incorporating newest uh, people who is helping us with some specific seminars, people who came from criminology former students of criminology that they are doing some some criminology work outside in the police in the juvenile justice in the rehabilitation system in many aspects and they they, they as a partial time not full time partial time they give some do some seminar i don't know whether i can inform you exactly the what yeah, is yeah. the situation in each university you need to have a more specific knowledge yeah. but i think this idea the the idea is the two main ideas is one, incorporating people from other departments. And the second idea is, I imagine that the new people that have studied criminology, some of them, they are being incorporating as in, in the staff of the, the programs in criminology. Yeah. I think. Well, yeah, of course, when you do this, you need someone to put, you need, you need a sort of Lionel Messi eh, that would put together all these uh, different uh, things, because otherwise, uh, many people call doing multidisciplinary research to have one sociologist doing the part of sociology, one uh, mathematician doing the part of math mathematics, and 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 this is not. I mean, but few people, Norbert Elias, for example, managed to put this together. Uh, and I think uh, what happened is that you play this role, for example, in in your program of linking all this because otherwise it's a very fragmented education it's a, it's quite I, i'm i think it's quite a challenge and i'm surprised to see the number of degrees that exist in uh, in spain and then yeah and my reference is the persons that, that are involved in uh, mainly in the conference of the european society of criminology this is like a group of 10 universities but there are much more but of course that is quite uh, quite complicated and one thing that we also like to ask our um, guests is um, and the question is how crime changed during your lifetime. Now, we already discussed about crime in Barcelona in the 80s, but if you put this in, in, yeah, in the context of how it is now, which we, you mentioned that it was quite a complicated issue in the 1980s, I suppose during the dictatorship, as with any dictatorships, the repression was so big that probably um, what you had was um, mainly political dissidents, but I don't know. And then what? How, how, how is the situation now? I think in Spain there were a lot of changes eh, in, a, in a lifetime. I think the evolution of, of, um, of crime has been similar in Spain than in other countries. I think during the dictatorship, of course, it, we have a lot of political uh, prisoners. We have a lot of political repression. Of course, crime existed. It increases very much in the 60s and 70s, although the statistics were not very good, but we know that it, it increased like in other countries in Europe. And then it increased very much with the beginning of democracy. The reasons are different and difficult to say. Of course, I mentioned the, of, there was an economical crisis, but as you know, the, the question of the relation between crisis and crime is not clear. But there was the problem with drugs. I think this was relevant. Some people, as you know, some people say that 
the question of the increasing of crime in the is question also of this is the idea of P Stephen Pinker. Stephen Pinker. Yeah. Stephen ah, Pinker. Okay, okay. This is the, the his thesis. I don't know. This is the liberalization produced some crime. Maybe drugs, all of this idea. This is his idea. I, I, when I read the book, I think maybe in Spain it can explain something. Okay, the question is of course, we have a problem with crime in the 80s, it was very big. And then afterwards, it has improved very clearly. I think every, it has improved. I think, of course, there is crime in Barcelona, there is some areas, it, it exists, but not at the level of that is a big concern for the people. Is a concern, not a big concern. That would be, and I, the, the difference between, in the 80s, there was like a big concern. Today, I think in, in general, people, of course, the idea is it has other things have changed. It means we have, as you know, as societies are, they, we have the process of criminal, criminalization is much, much, much bigger now with uh, with gender violence, with sexual offenses, with even with white collar crimes, with many dimensions. It means, but this is another aspect. But the idea of uh, crime, I think it has evolved at least some kind of crimes, a bit a street crime. I, I think it has evolved in a good way. In, in Spain, I think, and, and cities tend to be safer and, than they were uh, 40 years ago, of course. That's yeah. that's the, the idea, yeah. I think it's quite difficult because, of course, Spain has a very low homicide uh, rate. Look at the robbery, for example. This is one example, the importance of robbery. Robbery yeah. was, the, the in your statistics, in the statistics of space, you find that the robbery uh, from the 80s to now have a very important uh, reduction. Street robbery is quite a crime that is relevant. This is quite difficult that you suffer today on street robbery. They have other crimes. I don't, I don't yeah. say it, that they, but it means that some crimes, especially the more vi violent, I think, David, I agree with Pinker in the idea that what is disappearing is violent crime. It, yeah. We are always less violent society. That's yeah. my, I think Pinker is completely right in that. <laughs> I, I would not give paternity of the idea to Pinker, of course. This is uh, Elias and then in criminology is Gerd that introduced it in the 80s. Switzerland also there were the works of Kilias, which are less well known because they were published in the book in the Treaty of Criminology, although it's 1991. Then Manuel Eisner continued and Pinker put all this together. I, I admire him a lot, but um, I don't think it's his idea. And uh, yes, we are becoming less tolerant to violent, violence, I agree. The idea is from Norbert Elias. Yeah, exactly. But he has popularize the idea. The idea is for not the idea of, of course is for Norbert Elias. Yeah. Yeah. But the the application, I mean this is again something that um, Lieben also mentioned that uh, publishing in in German uh, in other languages which are not English. So Elias published in Switzerland because uh, he couldn't publish in Germany because of his Jewish origin and he was exilated in in the UK. And then the book was translated only in the in the 70s and this is where Robert uh, Gerr took it and then Michael Tonry included him in uh, in one of the first issues, 1981, of Crime and Justice, an annual review of research. That is a good idea of someone who comes from outside criminology and sees the problems mm -hmm. uh, and then know that the historians are doing something different than the criminologists and the criminologists are very worried about crime increasing. And he says, pay attention to this. But um, I think one problem to study crime in Spain is difficult because Robbery, of course, went down, but still in comparative uh, perspective, it is a little bit higher, uh, even with um, uh, crime statistics, but even in the victimization service, when we still have the victimization, it's not that it's a major issue. I think that this is, the problem with the police statistics is that Spain receives more than 60 million tourists per year. Eh? And these are uh, suitable targets, and they report the offenses to the police. Uh, and when we did the research on victimization of tourists, the 10% were victims in two weeks. It's always minor things, but this, I think, has an impact on the statistics. The only problem is that there is no systematic, uh, well, in, in, in Catalonia, there is this uh, 
bit in survey, but it's not really exploited. I didn't see a lot of criminologists, uh, Catalan criminologists using this data and, and trying to show the evolution because there you should not have the impact of the um, of the tourists uh, as victims. Eh? You have the police that in principle, police statistics, they they have the impact of, of tourists. Exactly. That, that not is... only of victimization is very difficult. Yeah, course. I think that because that they is... Are not, they are not surveyed. But, but police statistics, I think, imagine they have. Yeah. Because I they go to the is... police in case they have a robbery. They exactly. think they go to the police. I think that could be one explanation of these levels of uh, robbery slightly higher than in other places. Because there yeah, are tourists walking in the city centre, looking at the tourist attractions. They take your purse or your your uh, your cell phone and they run away or in the beach. And and I think many of these cases are recorded as robbery, but it's just an hypothesis. The only trouble is that the latest uh, data from the crime victim service, of course, they were very small samples, show also a level of... Uh, Robbery, which is also slightly higher than the one I would have expected. This it is, has reduced yeah. very much, but it continues to be at the, in the comparative level. It is high, comparing with other co European yeah. countries. This yeah. is one of the only, one of the few examples, maybe the only one in which Spain is higher than other countries. Not, I think, not in general. To my knowledge, it's usually lower than for that. So the big change is the drugs and then the, the decrease of robbery. And you work a lot with the prisons, eh? prison population rate, and also the composition of the prison population. How this has changed during the time you work as a criminologist? It has changed very much. I think uh, in Spain there was a lot of problems with prisons. I think in the 80s there was like prisons were very problematic at the beginning of democracy. Remember that there was a amnesty for political prisoners, but not yeah. for social prisoners, they as they are, as they call themselves. And there was a big movement in prisons. There were a, a lot of riots in prison during this time. Then we have the law, the new law. We have the penitentiary law. The, the prisons were very old. They were very in bad, bad conditions. We rebuilt new prisons. We, we spent a lot of money with prisons, very, very modern. We changed the law. We put professionals in prisons. We improve the conditions, we improve the rights. It has changed very much. It has changed completely. I think I think Spanish prisons today are, I think, are very humane institutions. Of course, they can change. They are different. Not, not, all, not every prison is similar, is equal. They are very different. But in general, I would say that Spanish prisons are quite humane, com in a very good position comparing with other countries. I rem I guess I uh, yesterday I bring students my students to to one very international students from many countries in Europe they came to us the Catalan prison and they were quite impressed about the quality of life how was the life in prison the institute the the services anything I think it has changed very much the prison population has reduced very much after the 2010. And then the prison situation today is good, is acceptable. I think there is no overcrowding, at least in, in general. It's true that uh, the main problem in Spain is the idea of long sentences. Spain is one of the countries in Europe with less admissions to prison per, per 100,000 inhabitants. Is mm -hmm. But the problem is that the, the time in prison, the time that the prisoners spend in prison is quite is much higher than in other countries. And this is the problem, this is the reason why Spain continues to be high in imprisonment rates. But this is also improving. I think it's, it, in some years it would be the, the trend for me, the idea of the trend is that prison will be will continue to, re, to reduce. We are, we are in a process of reducing the use of prison. And the main reason for that, according to me, is that violence is reducing. And the idea, if you don't have a violent off offense, it's very difficult that the judge accept prison as a sentence. Yeah. Okay. Let's take that as a premise. And but if we look at uh, the idea was to go over. You, you are talking about from 2010. Eh? But if we look until I know very yeah. well from since 1983 because it's, this is the Council of European Statistics. 
it was more or less a constant increase with some peaks in 1980, uh, mm -hmm. the Olympic Games in 1982. It was an in a constant increase until uh, 2010 for a long time, independently of the trends in crime. Eh? That were, and then in 2010, there is, I think, this change also in the length of the sentences for um, drug dealing, for drug, um, mm -hmm. which may also have played a role. And then it decreases from 2010. Eh? There was a period of stabilization in the 90s. The, the idea is that was a, there was a period of increase in the 80s. Okay. Yeah. This was, according to me, it was the question of crime. Yeah. Then there was a period of stabilization in the 90s. And then there was a period of increase until 2010. And the, the increase, according to me, the, the second increase, the first one was crime. The second one was the, the criminal code uh, reform. You, as you remember, the idea is that they increase sentences and also they abolish good time credits. Yeah. And, and, and good, it means that the sentence were truth. Truth, yeah. truth in sentencing. This was not yeah. a politic in Spain at all. And it started, we have the, this politic of truth in sentencing that makes double the sentences. Yeah. That was the reason. We, and we, then in, in 2010, the question is that they reduce some, we, ch we, start, we change the politics in some aspects. We start, because we have a big problem <laughs> in, to, in 2010. And the idea was once we started, we have some reforms of the criminal law, reducing sentencing, this is one, one reason. Then they use more parole in order to yeah. reduce the use of prison. And then we have also this process that has always the, the, the idea of reduction of admissions. This, the admissions, what, we have always less admissions in prison. Even if they stay a lot of time, this, one of the factors that brings prison down is that always we have less people admitted in prison every year. I mean, one of the best rates in Europe. Yeah. It is quite interesting to because you mentioned the, the reform of the criminal code, and this is a reform yeah. of the criminal code in 1995, five, five. which is supposed to be the democratic criminal code, replacing the authoritarian one, but and then it's more punitive. You remember, in I think my explanation for that is you need to take into account that Spain has a problem that doesn't exist in the rest of Europe. That is terrorism. It's very yeah, important. This is something that we didn't mention until now. and that it Terrorism is very yeah. important. It was a difference. And the, I think it has had a very big influence on politics. Terrorism has also affected many other European countries. Yeah, but in but not until this time. UK has been affected. But Germany, terrorism disappeared in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. The yeah. Tyson, Brussels Airport in 2016, uh, Paris. But this uh, is domestic terrorism I'm talking about. Yeah. One thing is international terrorism, domestic terrorism, I think in Germany it disappeared, the Badermannhof, it disappeared, I don't know, remember, but in the 80s maybe, in Italy, Brigade, Brigate Rosse, it disappears yeah. in the 80s too, it means the only country that is different is UK, but I remind you that UK has also uh, harsh yeah, sentences. Yeah. Yeah. Spain has suffered from, from domestic terrorism until 2009. Uh -huh. Yeah, it has had an influence. I, according to me, it has had an influence on the severity of sentences. Yeah, not, I think it's a, it's a good point. Only, yeah. That's why I am also optimistic, because terrorism, fortunately, it has disappeared also in Spain. But terrorism was very relevant. The idea is when you they, you do as, you have a new law, you think maybe in the best in the worst case, and the worst case what. What they did, the idea of abolishing abolishing good time credits, because also of terrorists, yeah. in order to prevent that terrorists will benefit from good time credits. Yeah, this is a it's a very good explanation. These good time credits, uh, the living it was for one day of work in prison, it counted as two days of the sentence. It was called redemption. Eh? Is that that is the term, if, if I'm correct? Eh? Exactly. And so uh, what we tend to forget is that uh, 
ETA was killing a lot of people. They were very active in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, and even in the 2000s. And uh, yeah, we have to go back there because then jihadist terrorism changed completely the the focus. Uh, but when you go, there is a, a six episode series in Amazon Prime, which is very good about that. It was a major issue. And I think, Pepe, I, I did not realize this is a very good explanation. I think a very good way of... Um, yeah, of understanding what happened there. It's uh, an hypothesis. This is not something that you can prove. <laughs> yeah. It's only one possible explanation. Another, but it's very difficult to. Only you can do a comparative work, but it's difficult. This. Yeah. Okay. So I I think that um, yeah I really like this discussion about uh, it takes some time. You know that is why we we foresee a lot of time for this um, for for these interviews because sometimes it takes a long time to get to the there is only one more thing that I would like to ask you, and then it's uh, about the composition of the prison population. There is a change in Spain when you look at it in terms of, like, the percentage of, uh, of women prisoners a, yeah. is stable. Yeah, yeah, it has changed very much because if you went to, if you look at the prison, sometime, of course, 70% of the people, I think 70, is people sentenced by property offenses, drug offenses. This continued to be true. 65 maybe i don't understand it now the name but probably the idea is that you have um other offenses that you that there couldn't exist before for example now you have some people uh, in prison with uh, gender violence uh, dom or domestic violence offenses you didn't have 20 30 years ago because there was not a crime <laughs> or oh, there was a misdemeanor, as the American said. Other thing you have, you can have in a prison is that you have some people sentenced by driving under the influence, driving without in the permit. Every the, all of these offenses, you don't have any one of these people under 40 years ago because yeah. there was no crime at all. And then, of course, even if you look at the property offenses, offenders. The idea is, of course, before you have a lot of people sentenced by robbery and uh, with drug problems, a lot of people, and this has changed very much. This is this has changed also. It means that, of course, they are property offenders, but not maybe they have drug problems too. It's not saying that the drug problem has disappeared, but the problem with heroin that yeah. we have in the 80s the, the prisons were full of people the heroin addicted and this is not much the problem today it means we have a prison population that would say less problematic that would be yeah. my question but and, and the, another change important change is that we have more foreigners in prison that is another change of course yeah because in catalonia is more than 30 percent if i remember correctly yeah or so used to something be. like 30%, 35%, yeah, I don't like remember that. now it's a, the target you, number, but of course this has changed completely, yeah. The increase of foreigners is also drug-related, dealing versus... Uh, I don't think so, I don't think so. It's not drug-related. The increase of foreigners is because Spain has the number of four in the, in the during this time, uh, it has, has a, num a process of immigration, of course, mm -hmm. I think maybe it's 12% of the Spanish population is in migrant population. This part of the population is the ones, the ones who live in worse conditions. And I think it's normal that this more affected by crime than other parts of the population. And of course, you can say also that there is more pressure in this population, more criminalization. It can be a it can be play, it can play a role too. But I think the main problem is that of course um, if you look at the neighborhoods, for example, if you go to some neighborhoods in Barcelona, the more the private ones, the more the composition of the more the private neighborhoods are very immigrant. And it means it's normal that the, in the more the private neighborhoods there is more crime and it means that you have more immigrants in prison. That could be my main explanation for that. Of course, there are other, I, this is also a, it's not that I'm giving the evidence to you. I think it's my hypothesis. Okay, Pepe, then what? Thank you very much. It was really Thank nice you. to have uh, this discussion. We we went to subjects that were not completely um, foreseen in the, uh, before, eh? but uh, I don't know, Levin, which was, I, I really enjoyed this discussion.
Yeah, I think it's important that we have the, I mean, ability to also ask questions about topics which were not prepared because this is the unique uh, aspect of, of this podcast series. We have the main topics which were dealt with and then we can delve into some specific issues which are related to different countries. So we get a unique insight. So thank you for giving us this unique insight in uh, criminology in Spain, which was very interesting for me because to be honest, some, there are some aspects of criminology, especially in, in Spain and Italy, which are completely or less known to me. So I, I can imagine that our listeners will also um, have learned a lot when they listen to our podcast. So thanks a lot. Muchas gracias. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Livin. Thank you, Marcelo. Carlos, thank, you. Hey, thank you very much. Bye, Hasta Pepe. Luego, All the best. Bye bye. 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 Hasta luego. Bye. bye. Thank you for following Liven and Marcelo's Criminology Podcast. This podcast is edited by Eduardo Coco from the University of Lausanne. Our theme song is Seagull's Night, Noche de Gaviotas, composed by Gustavo Cantero, arranged by Tato Germano, and played by Tato and Gustavo with the voices of Sasha Conte and Alejandro Turco Gujot. Your host are Lieben Pauvels from Ghent University, Belgium, and Marcelo Aedi from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland. Cheers, and see you soon.